All right, this week we're going to look at Form 22D and 22K. So the 22D is called the Optional Clauses Addendum, and 22K is the Utility Addendum. So optional clauses, I, I kind of started this whole idea with what is the purpose of this form? Why are we bothering to even use this? And what the 22D is, is it is a list of optional clauses we can add to the purchase and sale agreement. Its purpose is to contain the most commonly used clauses and add them in. The reason it's on one form like this is because we are not licensed to draft these clauses ourselves. So if we wanted to add something in that would be, you know, in reference to anything of the listed clauses, we're not licensed to do that. These ones are drafted by a lawyer already filled out for us. So um, the clauses here are safe to incorporate in our contract and they're done in an easy format with checkboxes. I pulled up the 22D so we could all reference the form that I'm talking about today. Um, and I will go through it in more detail line by line. Okay, so first when we're doing the 22D, as a reminder, we just wanna make sure that the date that we have up top matches the rest of the purchase and sale. And that is typically the date the contract was drafted. We also wanna make sure that when we're using optional clauses, because they are clauses to be incorporated with the rest of the contract that we actually are referencing the correct purchase and sale agreement that it belongs to. With this form, if the boxes are not checked, that means they are not included. Okay, so the first one, which is always a really great box to check, even if you use no other box, is the square footage and lot line size encroachments. Um, it's just kind of a way for us to say, hey, you know what? We can't verify lot lines, square footage or anything else. So please hold us harmless. Um, you're going to be deciding these things to your own satisfaction buyer. It just kind of gets us a little bit off the hook. So that's always a, a suggested box that I have right there. When it comes to title insurance, we already have a clause in the purchase and sale agreement that tells us that title insurance will be purchased. They have what they call a homeowner's policy. And if for some reason the property cannot be insured by the homeowner's policy, then that's when we can look into secondary type title insurances and how that coverage will work to make our sale happen. Um, we typically don't check these boxes unless there is something wrong with being able to insure it with that homeowner's policy. As kind of a rule of thumb, uh, by checking the first box for the standard owner's coverage, it usually means the seller is going to be responsible to pay more out of pocket. And the extended coverage one typically means the buyer will be on the hook to pay a little bit more out of pocket. Um, both these options do cost more money than your typical coverage. So check with escrow to see if these are required for your sale. Um, keep in mind as well that some of these extra coverages may also require things like surveys or um, something else to kind of just wrap it all up nicely and make sure it's insured. One of the most controversial boxes is, are going to be boxes three and four. So box number three is for seller cleaning. It says literally that the seller shall clean the interiors of any structures, remove all trash and debris and rubbish from the property prior to buyer taking possession. But there's a lot of misconception with what does it actually mean to clean? Um, does this actually, by checking this box, put any responsibility in that seller's hands to do anything more than just take their garbage away? Um, this option does not really create any agreement that that seller is going to hire a professional cleaner or even get down on their hands and knees and scrub the floor. It doesn't promise anything other than the removal of trash, personal belongings, and any extra debris. And I say debris in quotes um, because I've even had a, um, a buyer after the fact say that... Um, Tree stumps were in the backyard woods, and that's considered debris. So the definition of what it takes to kind of 
move along with this paragraph or this clause, I'm sorry, is, is really kind of up in the air for interpretation. I guess what I'm saying is if you're going to check the box for seller cleaning and your client has an expectation of what that means, you're going to definitely want to put that as another clause in this and create that obligation for the seller to do whatever it is that that buyer is expecting. Don't go along your entire transaction and wait till the day of your final walkthrough to bring it up that you were supposed to have a professional cleaning because if it's not the contract, it's not going to happen. Number four, personal property is also another one that um, it's I would definitely recommend checking because this goes along with number three. So unless you've agreed otherwise, the seller is going to take away everything from the property. And that's no later than the possession date. Um, what happens after possession date is as soon as nine o'clock hits, the new buyer that comes around now legally owns the things you've left behind. This clause says so right here. So there's no right that a seller has to come back after closing, after possession, to try to come back and reclaim any of the items left behind. And um, this puts the seller in a position where they are responsible for removing all of their belongings. It also clearly states, again, that anything left behind automatically becomes the buyer's at 9 p.m., the day of closing. Utilities is sometimes a box that gets glanced by, uh, minimally checked off, or um, sometimes we just don't really fill it out accurately. This is not the same thing as disclosing the lienable utilities that a 22K does. This is saying, to the best of the seller's knowledge, these utilities are actually connected to the property. So we want to make sure when we're checking off these boxes, we know for sure. Is it connected to public water? Is it connected to a well? If it is connected to a well, do you know the type of well? Is it a one-party well that's on the property? Is it um, a community well? Is it city water? I mean, you need to know what it is connected to. Same with septic tank and sewer mains. Now, if you don't know something, it's probably a good idea to leave it blank because checking the wrong box here may have more negative consequences than just not knowing. So um, just check off the things you do know. Typically, you're going to know water, power, electricity. Sometimes you'll have cable, internet. Make sure if you are checking cable or internet and you say it is connected to the property that it actually is run to the house and connected to the home itself. <laughs> um, if you have cable that's run into the street in front of the house, that's not technically connected. Uh, so if you're saying right here that there is internet and it's connected by putting it in this box, and the buyer goes in and finds out they need to pay a cable company to run that wire from the street down their driveway to their house, they may have issue with the fact that this was potentially filled out incorrect. So the utilities, um, it does matter how accurate they are. And um, like I said, the cost can be expensive. So please mark down what you know. And as a seller, try to make this as accurate of a representation as possible. And um, keeping in mind, if you misrepresent this, it could leave you in sort of a really awkward, sticky situation. Uh, new construction, if you know it, and it is new construction, you can fill, fill this out. It's pretty self-explanatory for paragraph six. Lease reviews. So if there is a security system, a propane tank, Satellite, um, things that are not listed on here might be a uh, solar panels, um, any item that has something leased that stays with the property. This is not for something that the, the seller is just going to take with them later. This is things that stay with the property. Uh, the buyer does have the right to look at that lease. And just for the purpose of the conversation, not getting complicated, I'm going to just leave everything with the default days when I refer to these timelines. But they do have, the buyer has five days to receive the lease agreements for whatever is being agreed to. Typically, you're going to look at a propane lease, right? 
once that lease is delivered, the buyer has five days to review it. And if for some reason, what comes with the house is not something they want to keep moving forward with, they do have options of either asking that seller to end the lease at the closing date, or um, if they accept it, they can take over the lease at closing. What happens with propane is that it's all the propane in the tanks are prorated. So the seller pays for the time they've used it. The buyer pays for the time they're going to take over. And the propane lease is similarly done where it transfers ownership at closing, um, but it's with the same company and the same terms. Uh, so the buyer does need to be aware of what they are getting into. If they wanna change propane companies, this would be a great time to find out what other companies service the area. I know in smaller neighborhoods, there are certain propane companies that kind of have more of a dominant presence on certain streets. Um, so it may not always be possible to change this. That's why you want to give them the most chance they can to make sure that they know what they're getting into with this lease and that they are aware of this. Um, the buyer will have a chance to review it. And if they're not satisfied, they do have the right to terminate. Um, there's not really a termination form for this type of lease um, that I saw. I mean, there's other terminations. You can use a Form 90 as a notice. Um, there's a lease review, but um, there's all sorts of lease reviews in contracts like um, rental agreements and all that too. So if the buyer wants to terminate, look in the Form 90 section for the termination notices. Also watch your computation of time because you do have two different timelines that you're working with in here. And the second timeline is dependent on the delivery of the first timeline. Homeowners Association is the same sort of timeline. We're working with two different obligation dates here. So without being changed, a homeowner's review period is 10 days. Um, once the buyer receives the documents, they have five days to review them. They either, they can receive them on day one, they can receive them on day 10, but once they receive them, they do have their five days. Now, as a seller, there is a list of these required documents that you do need to deliver. So it would be a great idea to make sure you've gathered all of the things listed here. Now, if it's an HOA that doesn't necessarily have meeting minutes, or if the HOA is just a limited HOA where they only take care of a couple things, what I would probably do to just prove that you've done your part of this requirement here is list off the things they have and list off the things that they don't actually do. So if they don't do meeting minutes and there are no meeting minutes, just make a note that there are no meeting minutes. If you have meeting minutes, just pull as many as you can from the prior two years. Um, and I would advise delivering all of this together uh, because once it is delivered, that buyer's five days starts. So what happens if any of these timelines that we've talked about in the last two pages don't get delivered? Uh, what happens if documents are never delivered on the 10th day? Or, um, you know, how long does the buyer have to respond if those documents are never delivered? And I did, I did also touch on the best way to ensure the delivery of these and that the seller is complying. Um, what happens if there is an HOA and you didn't know this, so the box was never checked and found out later? How do you deal with that? Um, do this, does the seller have to deliver those documents? And what happens if there are documents requested that don't exist? So if the documents are never delivered on the 10th day, that five day response time does start. So keep your timelines in mind. If you have not received the documents by the 10th day, your buyer has to be on notice that they have five days to decide how they want to proceed. So um, how long does it, how long does the buyer have to respond? Five days. The seller needs to gather the list if they can, everything on the list. Um, if there are no documents 
or if there is an HOA, but the HOA documents were never checked off on the optional clauses or never delivered, um, the buyer, or sorry, the seller does not have any obligation to send you HOA documents if you didn't check off the HOA box. So try to find out from the title or, um, I don't know if you can always depend on the listing agent, but to try to find out before writing up the offer if there actually is an HOA, because without that box checked, you are not going to be delivered any of those documents. You won't have a chance to review them and you definitely will not have a chance to make a decision based on what is in those documents. And then sellers, when you're delivering things, just make a note of which documents you are delivering. Um, I did kind of see an issue with a few HOAs. They have such large files that they couldn't be delivered or had to be delivered in a zip. So communication with the agent on the other end is going to be key on this. You'll want to make sure that they are delivered. And if they can't be opened, we may have to go through extremes to make sure they're delivered, you know, delivering them in separate emails. Um, I hate to even say printing, but sometimes if there's no other option, maybe print it, do what you can to prove that you are delivering it. All right, with an HOA transfer fee, um, if this box is not checked and there is an HOA transfer fee, it's going to default to whatever the rules of the HOA says. So the HOA does, if they have the transfer fee, they're going to have the responsible person for paying that listed in their documents as well. So if you don't want to negotiate that or you don't care, it's going to default to whatever the rules of the HOA are. Excluded items are items that basically would have otherwise been included. So um, like attached items. This would be, if you wanted something removed from this category, a good example would be maybe a dishwasher, bookshelves, TV mounts. Um, and by removing the items, basically the seller being responsible for removing these items could potentially damage the home in doing so. So this also has a clause in there that addresses that. Um, leaving the seller responsible for any damage from the removal of those items. Okay, home warranties are available. Uh, we, I think um, you can talk to your transaction. Me. What's that? <laughs> Me. Yes, I was gonna say you can talk to your <laughs> transaction coordinator about the home warranty. Um, this. I would just double check like all the current prices and, and what the current home warranty actually says before you fill out anything in this category. And then finally, our favorite space is this blank space at the bottom. So this form, remember, is called our optional clauses, clauses that are incorporated with our purchase and sale agreement. So technically, we could put anything in section 12 that we also could put in a form 34. Um, my my greatest suggestion is, um, you know, this is a good spot to put things like you're a licensed broker in the state of Washington, you're related to the seller, you know, these smaller sort of clauses. Um, if you are noting something, a notable change on here, I would just try to make it as obvious as possible. Not try to sneak this in through anything with making the font super small. Um, if you have compensation changes that you're trying to make, I would probably ask you to use a 41C unless there's something that really doesn't make sense to put on the 41C. I mean, you could potentially put it here, um, but try to use each of the forms that are in our forms library for what they're intended. So if there's something you're writing in here and there's a form that corresponds for it that try to use the form that's meant for what you're trying to do. So the other space should be for things that don't exist already in our forms library. I did wanna to touch on the 22K because we're kind of talking about utilities. We're talking about these little clauses that are put in here. So in the state of Washington, it is uh, required for a buyer to request from the seller 
a disclosure on all the utilities that have lienable rights on the property. The form is an instruction for escrow authorizing the allocation of the payments to these companies at closing. So this applies to all real property, including commercial, and this form must be requested. I'm air quoting and you can't see it, but it is a request that has to be made. It's not a requirement for the seller to provide without request. If no boxes are checked, then it is considered waived. So if you want it, make sure you're checking in on the front page of your purchase and sale agreement. Now, it's probably one of the least filled out forms in our entire forms library. It's the one I see blank the most times. So how do we handle that if we have a buyer and what this is telling escrow is how to pay out these companies that have lienable rights on the property. Now that idea in itself is going to affect a buyer more than a seller. So there's not a whole lot of um, incentive for a seller to want to get this list up and going. Um, a seller not filling out the 22K is only going to hurt a buyer. If you find yourself in a position where the seller has not completed the form, please just take a minute and the initiative to complete the form for your buyer. Um, this is one form that agents are in fact permitted to fill out. And remember, this is a more, it, it, this is basically a disclosure of those lienable utilities. So the escrow can just allocate how to, how and who to pay off. All right, well, that concludes the discussion on 22K and 22D. I will open it up if anybody has any questions and thank you for listening.